Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Chaz Fisher, General Manager of Boker Knives USA. Boker is a company I have always valued for its collaborations with custom knife makers, allowing the average Joe, such as myself, to enjoy the finer custom designs otherwise out of reach. Uh, That's always been my attachment. Uh, But I met Chaz at Blade Show this year and immediately began to wonder what it must be like working for a company that's been making knives for nearly 200 years or maybe more, and with factory and distribution all over the world, uh, how does he get any work done with that staggering selection of knives all about? Well, I'm betting the answer is that making these knives a reality is much more fun than actually collecting them. We'll find out about that, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, uh, if you like what we do here, think it's worth the scratch and the time, go to Patreon and check out the different uh, levels of support we have, the knife giveaways, the exclusive content, and so much more. Uh, quickest way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Chaz, welcome to the show. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. Uh, When I met you uh, in Atlanta at Blade Show this year, actually, one of the first things you told me was that your brother was also presenting and is a knife maker and uh, made me think, is there is there something in the family? Have you always been into knives? Well, I I think just a a from birth obsession with uh, with the Fisher boys of of all things sharp and pointy. So I know that each of us have have had that uh, since an early age. Wow. Yeah. So, so that landed Nothing you commercially. Okay. Gotcha. Well, so that landed you a, a career in knives, um, man, which is enviable to a lot of us, uh, I'm sure. Um, but like anything, the grass is, uh, the, the grass can appear green from a distance. So, uh, tell me how you got into uh, knives as a career and, uh, what the trajectory of that looked like. Well, my, my, professional knife career is, is not especially long, actually. Um, I've been with Boker less than a year now, about nine months now. And before that, for several years, I worked with uh, SOG, uh, SOG Knives. And I got pulled into SOG because of a connection that I had who was there, the, the president that at the time I had worked with him in the outdoor industry, kind of the broader outdoor industry, uh, which is where I came from. And uh, he was um, uh, pulling off a turnaround of SOG, a turnaround and sale of SOG and, uh, recruited me as part of that team. And so that's how I got pulled into SOG. And, you know, I, I have to admit, you said it was, you know, it's grass is always greener. It, it appeared greener and, uh, and I thought I'd, I'd jump over to it and it, it has been greener. So it's been a, a really great run to, to work with knives. I love it. Uh, SOG went through a, a big, um, retooling a couple of years back i i my first exposure to sog was through their version of the mac v sog bowie that's what yeah. basically launched them and always loved that and i have one and want more but um you know then they went through a sort of a big box period mm-hmm. and then they came out of that so elegantly and you were a part of that yep yeah. yeah that was uh you know of course a lot of people put a lot of effort into that um you know, but I was part of that, you know, at that table of the the people who uh, staged that uh, repositioning of the brand. So what is the work like for you uh, in a in a company like like SOG or now Boker? Well, it's uh, you know, it's complex. I mean, it's uh, it's and it's not easy. It's, uh, you know, of course, I love knives and I, I say that the grass is green here and it is. And I, you know, every day I get to uh, 
hold the things that we make and really am into them, right? Because I, I love knives. Um, but like any you know business, there there are a lot of headaches, there are a lot of fires mm -hmm. every day. There are there are problems that arise that need to be solved, and most of them are not as glamorous as as uh, you know just hanging out and playing with knives. But um, but it is it is uh, you know it's both um, challenging and rewarding, just like any job. But it's uh, you know especially compelling for me because it, it does have to do with knives, and I you know like we've discussed. That has always been a really big passion of mine. Boker as a as a as the company we know it now. I mean, before we started rolling, you said they've been going way back, and I want to find out about that. But as the company we know now, they started in the 1830s, early 1830s. Depending on which company you're talking about, the okay. German one or the American one. Um, yeah. Our, our official date that we use is, I believe it's 1869, uh, the, that Boker in Solingen was founded. Uh, prior to that, the Bokers were making, uh, making blades of some kind for quite a bit before that. And I don't know precisely how long they go back, but, you know, more than 100 years. Uh, in 1834, when they were making knives, but not in, in the town of Solingen, they did uh, send one of the one of the brothers over to the to the U.S. to found Boker USA. I believe that that was 1838 or so. Um, and so that was when Boker first hit the shores of America. Um, and of course, they were making over there. But 1869 is when they officially um, um, founded the company in Zollingen. And so I, I, I saw an interesting factoid that. <clears throat> They made muskets and 18,000 sabers mm -hmm. during the Civil War for the Union. It, That's, I no idea about that. Um, yeah, that was uh, Boker USA that did that. And um, yeah, for a period of time, they were in the top 10, 10 armament suppliers to the Union Army, both for for firearms, but also for, for sabers. Okay, so since then, Boker has grown. I, I think there are three main columns that that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I there might be more. Uh, Boker Plus. There's Tree Brand, uh, and and um, what is uh, what is the what are the other? Um, well, there's lines? there's Magnum, mm -hmm, Magnum, right. which is kind of our price point entry level stuff. Okay. Um, there's Boker Plus, um, which you know is and, you know, there are different there are different sourcing strategies behind each of these, um, which I'll sort of touch on. Um, it, uh, Boker, Boker, so Boker Magnum, Boker Plus is is kind of at a, a layer, a stratum above that. Uh, then there's Boker Arbolito, which is um, made, which is our our company in Argentina, uh, because that's been around for quite a while. Around the same time, I think that uh, that Boker USA was founded. Uh, another one of the brothers went down to South America and um, and started that thing. And then there's Boker Zollingen, which is Boker, Germany, you know, made in the factory in the in Zollingen in Germany. So those are the kind of the right now, the four major sub brands that we operate with. OK. And and in what realm do you operate primarily? Well, I I run the North American unit. And so I work with all those sub brands. Okay. Um and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I manage the, the, the body of business in the States. Jeez. Okay. So that, that is a huge, that's what I was expecting because general manager in, in my line of work basically, basically runs the station, runs everything, uh, mm -hmm. does all of this strategizing, you know, does all mm -hmm. the strategy and, and such, mm -hmm. and really, you know, guides, guides the ship uh, to a great extent. So that's why I'm a little gobsmacked that one <clears throat> one person, obviously you have help, mm -hmm. but is doing that gets to do that um, for the North Americas because or, or for the American uh, market, because there are so many opportunities there for you to to uh, grow the company in interesting ways. And one of the ways I, I've always loved is the uh, collaborations. Yeah, we do. I have this field part life. of our business right now. Yeah. yeah. So. How how do you work that in? How did how did this become an important part of Boker's business model? And and how do you uh, search for talent? 
Well, I, I, I think it might have been accidental. I think it's been going on for quite some time, obviously, you know, longer than I've been here. Uh, and I, I think that you know, for, for many years, Boker was, you know, Bo Boker comes from, you know, what what we would call gentleman knives or grandpa knives, right? You know, stag handled, you know, big bolster, um, slip joint knives. Um, and then I think when the knife market started to really change post-war, uh, you know, into the 50s, 60s and 70s, uh, you know, the, the knife market changed. It was influenced, of course, by, by what happened during the war. Um, you know, tactical knives kind of took off at some point. And uh, and so knife, the, the tastes of, I think, uh, global knife consumers changed. And as that happened, I think serendipitously, um, Boker was approached by designers or approached them or both and said, hey, you know, let's collaborate on something. And and so they ended up doing that. And I don't know how many designers we're working with now. Frankly, I have a hard time keeping track of all of our, you know, all, of, you know, I have a hard time keeping track of all of our SKUs because we have quite a few uh, and we have quite a few designers as well. And here in the States, we work with several, um, you know, Lucas Burnley is one of them. You know, Lucas works with other with other knife makers as well. Um, but it is a big part of our business and it's uh, it's exciting. It's fun. We constantly get to to uh, review cool new ideas and collaborate with these designers on them. And, and that is for sure a component of what has um, it's, it's fueled our growth, undoubtedly. And if you can link up with, well, someone like Lucas Burnley and the Quake, and I mean, sometimes I razz that knife on this show because, <laughs> because of all the iterations of it. But it's yeah. like it, it, there are there are certain knives, uh, the the one ten, the paramilitary two. You know, we mm -hmm. could name we can name a bunch that people never get tired. Uh, the case uh, Trapper, people yeah. never get tired of new versions of the same thing, and. Yeah. And uh, that knife is a is a huge one. And I feel like the yeah, the Boker Burnley Quaken really got Boker back on the map for me uh, way back when. And actually, before that, my brother had some switchblades from Boker that he got in the 80s as a high schooler. Uh, mm -hmm. That was that was actually my introduction. Um, <clears throat> but this, uh, uh, for instance, here, this this knife here is a knife that uh, I have always, I, it's just my grail knife in uh, to have a, a Marlowe squail. And it's yeah. the sort of thing that mere mortals just can't really get. Yeah. But the fact that I can get this beautifully made, I mean, this, this boker, this knife is so well made and so stout. Um, and I believe that's a Zollingen made blade. Should be. Is it? Oh, that's so cool. Yes. Yeah, I, I love this knife, and I, you know, Chuck Gadritis. I have a Chuck Gadritis, which uh, another great guy who I want to support, but I can't afford a Chuck Gadritis uh, mm -hmm. custom. Uh, this, this is, uh, this is the knife I was, <laughs> I was carrying when my youngest daughter was born. You know, the F three, also, uh, yeah, a Vox. So if you can lock in on certain designers like that, um, it could be great for everyone going forward, uh, designer, boker, and collector alike. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I said, yeah, it, it has fueled our growth and, and we're really happy with what we get out of it. Uh, and I think our customers are happy with it. So, you know, there's no, no doubt about it. We'll continue working with uh, the designers that uh, des designers like Lucas that bring great ideas to us. So how does the in-house designing work? And, and, and I would imagine that has something to do with your, overall plan for the company how do how do internal designs get handled and how do you curate uh what the look is going to be what the what the purpose is going to be well i mean there are a few ways that it happens uh but fundamentally uh you know there's there's a team in germany that um you know, prior to my arrival there there is a is a team in germany that produces ideas on an ongoing basis. And there's a team that reviews those and decides which ones to run and which ones not to run. Um, you have a slightly different and uh, uh, I think a, a, a rebirth, we, I, could, I would call it, of uh, actual Boker USA knives coming uh, in the not too distant future, which is um, a selection of knives that'll be entirely designed, you know, born, born in the US, designed in the U.S., um, built in the U.S., 
and uh, you know, which we haven't had for quite some time. Been, I think it's been since the probably the eighties since um, since Boker uh, Boker America knives were made. So um, the getting back to a more a firmer answer, there there are two ways now that it happens, and uh, you know, even with the Boker USA stuff. Uh, that's all done by the, the Boker USA and Boker Germany team. We review all those things and decide what goes forward and what doesn't. How do you, how do you gauge what kind of innovation uh, you're going to put forth? I mean, there always seems like there's something innovative coming out from mm -hmm. Boker. Do you, it, does that come just through, through um, um, uh, brainstorming and coming up with cool ideas or, or, or do you set out, before a season, before a design season yeah. and say, this season, we're going to do this. It can happen both ways. Um, and it's interesting you bring up innovation because I think, you know, there's a, you know, in the, in the quadrant of, of product design, you know, innovation can, can be great, but it also can be, um, you know, the, you know, the, there, there's a, the, the flip of it is reliability and, you know, in, in, innovation has runs the risk of being maybe not as reliable. So it sort of depends on what knife is, uh, what the knife is supposed to be for. And if the knife is supposed to be for something highly utilitarian and, um, uh, you know, with, with critical um, uh, consequences attached to it, you probably don't want a lot of innovation right out of the gate with the thing, because, you know, with innovation, comes a proving period. And sometimes it doesn't prove out to be perfect. Right. And so again, it sort of depends on where the product is, is um, intended for in that quadrant of, uh, of, of product and um, you know, novel, not novel, um, uh, innovative, reliable. And so uh, Sometimes it's uh, it's enough. The innovation is enough to just go ahead with it because it seems like a pretty cool thing, and we'll see what it's you know how how it it pans out. And uh, and sometimes we opt not to do it if it's for something that has um, high stakes involved in its use. Right, like right. Military or law enforcement or something like that. Right. It it seems like uh, an innovation that doesn't pan out to actually be that valuable or have that much utility can be sort of relegated to collectibles until mm -hmm. you've sold exactly. them all or whatever, however that, yep. that works. So you just need to know, you need to know what that knife is, is intended for. And, uh, and that helps guide you guide what level of innovation goes into it or, um, you know, materials, of course. This, uh, this past year, uh, sorry, I just interrupted you. Uh, in, in 2021, at Blade Show, the the most the the knife that won an innovation award. It was a Fox knife that has a. It was more the Fox system. It was on a little dagger. You, you yep. know what I'm talking about? It's like I know a track. Yeah, the, and I, I yeah, yeah. it's it's got the it's it's got an embedded sort of thumb yep. stud that you yep. uh, in, that runs in a track. And and I thought, oh, that's neat. You know, and I tried it, and I was like, oh, that that feels neat. And, and my, my big question was why, you know, and, and I thought, well, this is a great collectible. This is a, this is a cool thing to have. And maybe the whole purpose of this is to see if that really brings any valuable, uh, any value, or is that just something they could do and thought to do so did. Um, and I'm not picking on Fox. I love Fox knives, but uh, yeah. uh, that's just one of those, one of those innovations I saw, like, like that's a, that's a, a difference without a differentiation, you know, it's yeah. like, what's the purpose? Well, it is cool. You know, I, I know yeah. that knife and I've, I've played around with it and it's uh, it was absolutely worth doing. Um, and I love Fox too. We partner with Fox uh, on a number of different things. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm not going to speak ill of them here and I wouldn't anyway, because no, I, yeah. you know, there's, there's, I have rarely met a knife that I don't like something about. Um, and uh, and on that particular knife, and I'm I, I'm blanking on its name right now, but that is a, an innovative way of deploying the the blade, and um, absolutely worth trying to figure it out. And you know who knows, maybe maybe it will become some sort of a standard. I think that for um, for not for blades that require 100% um, foolproof. Um, knives that require 100% foolproof blade deployment, maybe not, not yet at least. I think it might need some work, but there's there's uh, absolutely no 
no downside really to putting an idea like that out there. It only gets better with time and, and testing. The um, So with something that's so old like knives, especially fixed blades, but I mean, do you think from your perspective as, uh, you know, someone who sees it all and runs one of the biggest operations, um, do you think there's a possibility of hitting peak knife where, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, I know um, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> we, ha we have that discussion internally. And um, I think that it's, you know, maybe, but you know, think about it. You know, we've been using knives since before we were really even homo sapiens, right? We've been using knives for, you know, you know, well over 500,000 years as hominids, right? And so, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it would be, I think it's too, too soon to say that peak knife is within our sight. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure right. that people are going to come up with some cool things that, that haven't been done before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if they don't, we have a whole history of awesome stuff to, uh, to yep. look back on. Um, so the uh, current projects you're working on now, what is exciting? What has just come out in this past year? What did you bring to, um, to blade show that you're especially proud of and excited about? Well, um, you know, a few of the things, one of the things that we do is, uh, and I'm holding one right now, uh, I'm holding the uh, M4 Sherman Damascus. Oh, cool. Uh, which is uh, a, a knife made uh, with Damascus steel in the blade. Uh, the Damascus includes steel from a, salvaged actual you know m4 sherman tank and um and that's just th th those are always very fun projects and one of the you know this is this wasn't new at blade but um is in the past couple of years um we've got a uh, messerschmitt um uh version of this you know of, of the idea wow. which uses messerschmitt messerschmitt Messer messerschmitt steel excuse me mm -hmm. um and so those are always exciting because they have so much history in them. They have so much actual history in the, in the blade. And uh, it's just really cool to hold something like that in your hand. And, uh, and it, you know, I, of course they're collectibles, but you, you could carry this, you know, you could carry it every day, you open boxes with it. If you wanted to, I wouldn't because I'd want to keep it kind of fresh and nice. Yeah. yeah. Can I see it? You keep teasing. Yeah. yeah sorry about that. <laughs> no, so sorry. it's got a micarta. Oh, you know, my card of scale. There's the Damascus. I think you can see that in the light there. Beautiful clip point blade. Nice. Yeah. Thumb and a lot back. of design elements are intended to, um, to reference the M4 tank, you know, oh. just the lines and, you know, the, the, the pivot is reminiscent of the, um, you know, the drive um, hub or whatever it's called on a, on an M4. Man, that's beautiful. And the pattern looks gorgeous on that steel. Yeah. That's a titanium frame lock. Yes. Uh, Messerschmitt, just you saying Messerschmitt, that, that, that's got to mean, I know Messer means knife. Messerschmitt must mean knife smith, right? Yeah, yeah, technically it does. Uh, but the Messerschmitt, you know, of course, was a famous yeah. uh, plane Airplane, that uh, yeah. was used in World War II. And, uh, and so we took, took the idea and applied it to the Messerschmitt. I love that. We've done it with a few other things. Originally, we did it with the Kalashnikov. That was one of the uh, projects that really kicked off that whole idea was uh, taking Kalashnikov uh, steel, Damascus. Uh, that, that was what I was, next thing I wanted to talk about is the Kalashnikov. I, I have the XL Bowie. I love this knife. Uh, very cool. This is this whole Kalashnikov line is vast. Uh, lots of really cool different blade shapes, which I love. Uh, great action on all of them. Relatively, uh, like quite affordable, uh, mm -hmm. very robust. These are just great knives. Uh, how did this come about? Like, what what what's the story behind the Kalashnikov, and why do you think it's so successful? Uh, well, you're right that it's. I mean, it is an entire franchise of, of knives for us. Uh, and it, it spans, you know, lots of different knife types. The story, as I have heard it, um, is that, um, our CEO, Karsten, uh, decided that it might be a good idea to 
to make a Kalashnikov with Kalashnikov himself with his blessing and sought him out, found him where he was living in Russia, uh, arranged a visit somehow. And I'm not sure the connections he used to do that. This is while he was still alive um, and went and met with him. And, um, you know, there's there are some stories around, you know, what they talked about, which I won't go into because at, at some point we'll probably uh, we'll probably tell the story. So I don't want to reveal too much of it. But uh, for the first time ever, he agreed to allow uh, somebody to make knives with his name on it. And so uh, that's how it started. I don't know the year that that happened. Um, but to my knowledge, Boker was the first company that he agreed to uh, to make that deal with and to have his name on knives. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, of course, you can't just slap someone's name yeah. on your blade like that. Yeah, he oh, agreed wow. to it. That is so cool. Yeah, these uh, these are so sturdy and reliable, and 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 it's the kind of knife that you can use. Very, I, this one I don't use; it's a little big, uh, but I have the uh, the dagger uh, desert uh, version, and yeah. you can just use it for anything. They just keep going. And mine, uh, that one was an Aus eight, very well heat treated Aus eight. Yeah. So uh, with Boker USA and you guiding this, what what do you want? where do you want to take the company? What are your concerns and what are the kind of things you want to bring uh, uniquely to the company? Well, you know, my concerns are many, you know, I talked earlier about fires every day and there are yeah. fires every day, operational fires and sales fires, um, marketing fires. Um, where I'd like to take us is uh, kind of back to the future. I mentioned it earlier that, you know, for a period of time, Boker USA was was designing and building knives right here in the States. Yeah. And that uh, that went away in the 80s. And so I want to take us back to that, uh, to having a full line of American designed and built knives in the States. So we will achieve that at some point. You know, it's challenging, of course, these days with uh, the loss of some manufacturing know how in the States. But we we can we know we can pull it off. Um, and, you know, commercially we have many challenges, uh, you know, I don't know how much you want to go into it on this, on this, uh, uh, podcast, but, um, you know, it's, it's a complex environment of sales channels out there, you know, with online and Amazon and independent stores and big box and, you know, specialty retail. Um, it's, uh, it, it's it's difficult to to manage all of those different channels and and make them all healthy at least the ones that you're in because they can compete with each other and mm -hmm. and um, you know in fact if you if you do it if you do it poorly you can you can kill yourself right and and that has happened to other brands before and and knife brands and um, you know you mentioned saw earlier saw got themselves I think into some trouble because of that because of their big box uh, excursion. And so uh, building a healthier balance of where where we sell knives through is is one of the things that I'm looking at, making sure that uh, wherever we are, whatever sales channel we're in, whether it's independent or uh, specialty chain or you know, all those that I mentioned, that uh, we are doing right by our partners in that channel and not um, um, posing risk to partners in other channels. So that requires product segmentation, requires strict adherence to, to um, pricing concerns. So those are some of the challenges that we're looking at, at uh, addressing in the coming year or so is making sure that we have a healthy business so that we can keep going for another, you know, hmm. 200 years yeah. or whatever it is. The, uh, the, the idea of bringing, manufacturer of these knives or some of them to the united states is so exciting and uh you know we talk about that a lot here a lot of the guests i have on the show are are always trying to figure out how to bring production here if they're making designs that are being produced overseas and a lot of the times <clears throat> excuse me a lot of the time it's not tenable because they're very small companies boker is a nice you know 
is a great company with a great reputation and history. And if anyone's going to be able to do it, it's a company like Boker. Mm -hmm. um, would and I don't just spitball and is it, would OEM be something that an American made a, a USA manufacturer, a Bokering manufacturing facility would consider? So that was didn't come out well, but you know what I mean. Would you OEM? Would we OEM for other makers? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, probably not. Um, I, you know, I, I would never say never, right? Um, you know, the first challenge is make sure that you can do it and build it and make sure that your your foundation is strong enough to support what your, your goals are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're a brand and we, we need to support our brand. And our brand is not that of just purely a, a manufacturer, right? We, we have a Boker brand. And so um, supporting that brand is priority number one. Mm -hmm. And if we get, if so long as we're doing that, then we would probably consider opportunities, but that's getting way ahead of the game for us. Yeah, sure. we, you know, first we've got to, you know, build up, build up a uh, strong platform for making stuff here. Yeah. I think that's uh hope against hope uh, in a lot of ways, just because uh, when asking people, it seems like uh, a very uphill climb uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to bring stuff, uh, manufacturing back here to a greater extent. Um, but that's, that's something to aim for. And, uh, I'm glad that Boker is starting that because, yeah. uh, others will follow and, yeah. you know, this might have to be, uh, a necessity in the future. Hopefully things remain free enough that it isn't, but you know, yeah. Uh, but in any case, uh, the knives that would be made here in the United States, what kind of difference uh, would you be aiming for in the product itself um, to distinguish it? To distinguish it from current Boker or just no, to, just to distinguish it in the marketplace? To, yeah, to distinguish it in the marketplace as an American made Boker. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, first, you know, what's, what's important to, to my team is making sure that whatever we we produce under that sort of new banner of of knives that we produce is, um, you know, I, I, to me it's important that knives that that those knives be purpose designed and purpose um, you know purpose made. Meaning, uh, you know, I don't I don't want us to uh, in that particular line, and we have many knives where this is not the case. Um, but in this in this line that we're talking about, um, it's important to me that they um, that you know, everything have a, has a purpose. Everything in the knife has a purpose and a use and a reason. And if it doesn't have a reason or a purpose or a use, then it shouldn't be there. So in other words, you know, embellishments are really not part of that line. Um, you know, to say it's utilitarian might be uh, misunderstood, but fundamentally that's what it means is that the knives have a have a reason for being and everything in that knife including its design and its materials um is made for that intended for that so that's probably number one um and you know luckily with you know all of the activities for which we want to design uh produce knives uh you know, and, and, and I know this being a knife user on a number of different fronts myself, you know, what's right for one person is not right for another person. So it's not like there is one ultimate, uh, you know, elk skinning knife. <laughs> there are, there are many ultimate elk skinning knives, as many as there are probably elk hunters. And so, uh, I don't think that we're, we, um, I don't, I don't think that there is a, um, the market is too crowded because I think that there are, there are always people who are going to want your particular vision of how thing, how a knife works. And, uh, I don't think that, you know, th that there, are, you know, other knife makers are doing a, a crummy job with it. I think that there are some amazing knives out there and in all sorts of different, uh, use scenarios. I just think there's a lot of opportunity for more and, uh, you know, other views of how a knife should be made to do a job and, uh, that's what I want to bring to the uh, new Boker America line. That sounds good. Uh, you have a really deep, wide 
catalog, so many products. Um, and, um, so how do you ensure, and, and now we're talking about the USA product, that's something a little different, but how does a, how do you across such a wide product line, a ensure that they're all kind of pulling their weight as designs. And it seems like you have so many knives always available. There are a couple of companies that I always comment on that, like they have a million models and they're always available. How, how do you manage that? How, how do you know whether a knife is pulling its weight? Well, I mean, that part is relatively easy. You look at your sales reports, sales. right? Um, how do you manage it? With great difficulty. It's, uh, it requires a lot of, um, you know, a lot of attention to detail and a lot of, uh, you know, warehouse space. And, uh, you know, luckily they're small items. And so, hmm. you know, they, they don't take up that much space really. Um, they they do they do take up bandwidth. I mean, it's, you know, skew proliferation is a problem for many companies, and you know, possibly even for Boker. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that we have reached a point where it's it's an alarming thing for me. Uh, I'm excited by it because it affords us a lot of opportunities. You know, like like I was kind of talking about earlier, being in so many different sales channels, it's nice to have this many items to offer to our sales channels because. Um, you know, we we're we're very well positioned to do some product segmentation by channels, right? And so that's one of the solutions that we're looking at. So um, I view it as a, um, a a real advantage for us that we have so many, and it's worth it's worth sort of the hassle that we have to go through to review them and make sure that you know there aren't any dogs in there. And if there are dogs, we we kick them out, right? Right, right. Um, but it's it's also a way for us to learn and learn really fast what resonates with people and what doesn't, and in Be, what markets. Because you have such a a, a wide sample, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah, yeah, and and then right, right, and and well, that's the beautiful part too about a company this old. I would imagine is that you're in a flow already. It's not like you're you're, you know, you came into this company. The company was in a flow. You're bringing your vision into this, and. Uh, and and you get to steer it but the company itself was was already you know was already there which is a uh and a trusted thing so it's kind of like the choices you make because they put their trust in you and the the public has trust in the brand man that's a great spot that's a great spot to be in oh it's um, exciting yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of upside for the brand in in america uh no doubt about it i'm you know really pretty pretty pleased to be in this position to put some of those ideas out there. You have the EDC market, you know, really on lock and, and then hunting seems really big. The tactical seems really big. And then it seems like you have real legit, like military, um, I don't know, maybe military contracts or you make military knives. You are very well uh, diversified across all those. Um, what to you is the, well, what to you is the most exciting of all of those? I know you're an outdoorsman, uh, but what's the most exciting to you? And then what do you think the world is the most in love with? Well, I think, uh, you know, there, there's sort of two categories that are exciting to me uh, professionally uh, and, and personally too, I suppose. Um, you know, the first one is, you know, what, what you call tactical, I would call it protect maybe is a, mm -hmm. is a, um, a word that we throw around a lot here at Boker. Um, so that category is exciting to me. Uh, and the, the overlap of that category with EDC is, is also exciting as, as of course is EDC, you know, EDC is just so wide and, and broad, you know, you do everything from, you know, pick lint out of, out of things to, uh, to opening boxes with, with, uh, with EDC knives. Um, but it could also mean, um, you know, what you carry every day to, uh, for self-protection. Right. Um, so those two categories and how they overlap are interesting to me. Uh, personally, you know, I, I am an outdoorsman and I, I hunt a fair bit. And so, um, uh, hunting knives has, uh, has a, a particular interest for me and, and for Boker. I think that we'll probably look at that space and see what we can produce there. Um, and, you know, military, 
who knows? That's that is, that is a tough game, and we have of course played in it before and and continue to. Um, but it changes quite rapidly and, you know, it's, it's feast or famine. And so I think that there are other, those other categories have more promise in the, in the long term for us. More the commercial market where, where you have people like me who, mm-hmm. who uh, get their minds set on a knife and then they just have to have it yeah. save up or whatever, just spend the money right then and there. And yeah. 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 Uh, what is your, Okay, so so we know you like the crossover uh, protect the self protection knives and EDC. That is definitely where my tastes are for folders. I do love big bowies and stuff like stuff that Arbolito makes um, uh, for sure. But what are your favorite models from Boker? Uh, personally, uh, favorites. I, I want you to I want you to name favorites. Okay, so that all the other ones feel jealous. No. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um... I, I, I have to admit this one I showed you uh, earlier, this um, M4 Sherman Damascus. Oh, yeah. I, I love its size. I love its uh, its pivot action is fantastic. Uh, it flips out incredibly easy because of that. I mean, it's just a beautiful um, uh, pivot action. Uh, so I like that. Um, like I said, I, I, I carry this, but I don't, I tend to not carry it too much because I don't want to hammer on it. It's a, it's a, almost too beautiful to do that. Uh, this Quake and Flipper is um, is another favorite of mine, really low profile. This titanium mini flipper. And uh, with a, you know, the um, liner oh, lock yeah. in it. Uh, so I like this because it's really skinny. I can fit it next to my phone in my front pocket. Oh. Uh, so those two I've been having fun with. Um, what else do I have around here? Of course I have you know, our oh, Slashnikov OTF, uh, which is really fun to, to bring out at dinner parties. Uh, it annoys my wife and gets the other dudes pretty excited. So it's, <laughs> it's fun to pull out for those things. <clears throat> um, those are kind of the three that have been floating in and out of my pocket the past couple of weeks. So do you just kind of rotate new bokers in and out of your pockets kind of? Boker and other and other knives. I like to use other people's knives as well, just to get a sense of what's going on out there and what I like about them, what I don't like about them. And um, um, yeah, I mean, I got others in here. I probably shouldn't be talking about this as a Boker guy, but I got a uh, an Emerson that that oh, I've been sweet. carrying for a few days to see what that's like. That's kind of interesting. Um, I have so, yeah. a nice nice little collection of them. They they take some getting used to, but I, I love yeah. my Emerson. So what do you think uh, the the trends? I mean, so you're you're not locked in on uh, Boker. You have a wandering eye, which is good and healthy uh, mm-hmm. so that you can bring new ideas and, and such. But what are some of the trends out there that you're seeing that you think will last? And what are some of the trends out there that you're seeing that you think, uh, you know, are, are just uh, going to go the way of the dodo? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Um... That's a tough question. That's a very good one. Um, I think that we're going to see there, there's been a trend to kind of exotic, maybe not expensive, but, but strange and exotic uh, scale materials. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can't even name some of them now. I'm visiting a, a customer not that long ago and they were showing me some kind of new, new stuff that they were, were doing with some special makeups with it. And, uh, so I think using cool materials as scale, um, sc- using cool scale materials, I think is a trend that will continue um, because it sort of, uh, it makes, you know, it makes it into a true fashion accessory thing. Yeah. You know, that's what, yeah. it, that's what they've become for a lot of people is kind of a yeah, functional fashion accessory. And so by using different materials, you get to, you get to have fun with it as the knife guy. Right. And yeah. um, so that's going to continue. I believe, I think that, uh, you know, we, we uh, with the work that, that uh, Acti has done and, and knife rights has done uh, the uh, acceptance of autos mm-hmm. is pretty cool is great. I'm you know, glad to see that it's happening. And, you know, we've, we've had even some really recent developments, I think in Pennsylvania that, um, that are positive for carrying autos. So I think that you're going to see some pretty cool um, things come out in autos, both, you know, regular, regular autos and OTF autos. 
So that's that's my guess is that people are going to jump on that and produce some, some really cool new innovative mechanisms probably in that field because they're the market is now yeah growing, right yeah oh i i hope so i i live in virginia and as of july 1st i've been able to carry by right, sell yeah. and all that yeah. um uh in in terms of things like say front flippers Mm -hmm. um, or something like that. How, how do you, at, especially in your position, um, how, how do you know whether to say, Hey guys, these front flippers are real big, go out there, make me four different front flipper models. Like, how do you, how do you know when to kind of jump into something that people seem to be all crazy about? And how do you know when just to kind of go about your business and, and see if it naturally evolves uh, out of your own design? I think that's hard to articulate. And I don't know that I, if I answered it, it would even be correct about how I do it. But I think that, um, you know, I think hunches when one has a hunch about something, and, it's, and this is the case with any product, right? It doesn't, you know, it could be nice yeah. or anything. Uh, good hunches are probably uh, subconsciously recognized patterns that, that you've, uh, that you can't articulate. And so it's a hunch. And so I think that, on something that you can't quite put your finger on why you think it's going to be, you know, a big deal. Um, in a lot of cases, in, in, you know, hopefully the, in most cases, your, your mind has observed enough information to spot patterns that you cannot articulate uh, consciously, don't even know about consciously. And so you think, Oh, I, I think this is going to be big. And so, um, but it's but it is always a, a roll of the dice, right? Because if it were so obvious that you could articulate it, then you could probably <laughs> analyze it and determine whether or not it was a good idea, um, you know, in a, in a quantifiable way. So I think that one way is just to trust that uh, hunch, which, again, I think is just good pattern recognition. Uh, and the other way is to wait for other people to prove it or not. And, and then you jump on it. And of course, by then it's, you've missed a, um, you missed the good timing of it. Um, so the way I look at it is I'm, you know, I, I think about my hunches really carefully and what I'm going to put my, you know, put all my money on <laughs> and, uh, mm. and, uh, and I pressure test it a while and then I walk away from it a little bit before I make my final decision so that I, I can make it with what I think is a, a clear head. I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, no, no. It, it, great it, question. it uh, well, it, it does because, uh, you know, that's, that it's not something you can nail down obviously. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that's, well, that's interesting to hear how someone in your position does that because that's yeah. not, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure the way, uh, the, the job comes with its pressures, you know, and you don't <laughs> want to be making too many hunches that you can't, that you don't feel yeah. positive about, but yes, for sure especially it's you you get that sense of uh um picking up patterns unrecognized patterns when you're driving you know you see someone swerve twice a little tiny bit and you know okay they're gonna come into my lane get ready yeah um that that kind of hunch that's an interesting way of putting and, it and you can have the same thing with a knife you know with a knife mechanism or you know a, a knife material or you know knife idea for a knife design you could see how somebody is using a knife and and subconsciously register that you know they're not doing anything with their with their index finger you know what if there were a thing over there yeah. that could you know flip the blade open you know that's that's i you know, somebody did that i don't know who did the, the first uh <laughs> flipper mechanism but uh at some point they that 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 is what went through their head and um um i'm glad they did it because you know flippers are kind of cool right they yeah they, they serve a pretty good purpose yeah, I feel like front flippers are kind of still in that adolescent phase where, I mean, I have a few and I like them um, and some are really great and some aren't. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is this necessary? I mean, <laughs> so much of it is not. And <clears throat> but I like to I, I don't know, I like to to think about it. I like to wonder because, you know, I, I, I've, I've been collecting knives my whole life, too. And I, I, I feel like I've seen things come and go. Is this something that's going to come and go? Well, if you don't jump on it early and get the recognition for inventing it, then you do get to benefit to see if it pans out and then, mm -hmm. okay, everyone's doing it. 
everyone wants it. Let's just do it and, and quietly put this out. We don't have to make a big deal about it, but uh, but you can follow it that way too. Do you yeah. design knives? Do you have a knife out there of your design that Boker is making or anyone else? Not the Boker's making. I've I've designed a knife for my brother's uh, outfit, a uh, hunting knife that that he's uh, he's got in his line uh, that, that I've personally used, you know, on some of my hunt trips. Um, but I have not designed myself any for Boker that are in production. Is this something you could take advantage of your position and and hand a designer a, a cocktail napkin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I would do that. You know, unabashedly, I would do that without any without any uh, shame. Uh, but I'm sure that they would, you know, uh, make it a real designer's, you know, uh, work. Right? right. It doesn't mean that there isn't some something fundamentally interesting about my napkin drawings um you know something that that could be used but i'm i'm not the guy who can produce the final knife design i'd, I'd rather have somebody who's really good with it and understands sure. form factors and you know kinesiology the hands and stuff to to make that happen so before you came to SOG and before you uh, moved over, you were in other outdoor industries and um, working, you know, doing similar kind of stuff in other fields. What would you say the knife, how would you say the knife industry is unique uh, from other industries you've worked in? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a little slow to adopt some new commercial um, ideas and, um, I'd say it's it's traditional. It's more traditional than the the broader outdoor market that uh, that I kind of uh, professionally grew up in. Um, but you know, we are dealing with man's oldest tool, so there's <laughs> there's uh, there's probably pretty good reason for it to be traditional in that sense. Uh, I think, um, and and it also all revolves around one thing you know you're not talking about tents right. uh, you know you're not you're not talking about tents and sleeping bags and camp stoves and you know whatever else you you need out there you're talking about one kind of item and you know we we kind of veered toward you know we we talked about peak knife earlier uh, one would think that we would have reached peak knife in 2022 uh, and a really good question and a, a scary one. If you, if you're a knife guy, you don't want it to be, yes, we've reached it. Um, but it's pretty amazing that this, this industry, uh, still continues to churn out really, really cool stuff after, uh, 500,000 years or whatever it's been of, of, uh, humans using this tool. And, um, so that is, that's, what's exciting to me is that, Every day, uh, just in, you know, of course, I've got a, a Boker catalog of stuff to look at, but I look at other people's items, too. And every day I see something that's interesting and um, and you know, catches my eye and makes me want to hold it and use it. I, I've never been uh, as enthusiastic about other products as I not even nearly as I am about knives. So I'm not sure. Uh, but it seems like the knife community uh in quotes, or just the knife community, uh, is very vocal and is really excited to give feedback. And in a lot of cases, knife makers and companies are very excited to receive that because they can hone their designs and, and their product to be what the, what the customer wants. Do you see that same sort of enthusiastic feedback in, in the, in the broader outdoor industry? Like, people sleeping bags are they excited about sleeping bags like they're about knives and and other Not to the same extent <clears throat> you know i think uh yeah it's it's uh it doesn't have the same passion to it that uh that knives seem to have um so no uh and and that you know the, another that is another great question because it it brings the idea of of passion into it you know, passion is something that Boker talks a lot about, passion about knives. And, uh, you know, yeah, these, you know, the people that, that, that use our knives that I talk to are, you know, they're, they're at a, at a completely different class of product users than, um, than users of other categories of products that I've dealt with before. And that's exciting because they care. I mean, they really care. 
Yeah. And you're right. They are very, very opinionated about it. And, and, uh, and, and sometimes they've got really great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get, uh, you want to get emotionally worked up about a finger toil. I can do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so tell, tell uh, listeners and viewers what they can expect from Boker uh, over the next year. And it just in terms of currents and such and uh, what they can look forward to. Well, over the next year, I think they can expect to see us out uh, um, interacting with them more. Um, you know, we, we have on our calendar um, the intent to go to you know events and uh, and places where where knife people congregate so that we can interact and engage with them more and understand what their needs are and what their preferences are. So uh, just the, a Boker presence is something that they'll probably see um, uh, see more of over the next year and certainly two years. Um, and sometime, of course, within I've, I've alluded to it a few times. Sometime in the next year or year and a half, uh, they'll see some uh, some new American-born designs trickling out there into the marketplace. Uh, and um, yeah, from a from kind of a knife person's point of view perspective out there, those are those are two things that you can expect to see coming from Boker soon. That's great. I think uh, I think um, knife fans and Boker Boker collectors and fans will love that sort of public outreach. Um, I know. Well, just as a nerd myself, I know I love that kind of stuff. And yep. well, that's the reason why people go to Blade Show and other shows like that at great expense to yep. to meet those people, meet the people who are making these things that we're so passionate about. Yeah, that's Chaz, how we met. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Chaz, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and talking all about Booker. It's been a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, it. You got it. Take care, sir. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Chaz Fisher from Boker USA, general manager. Uh, yeah, I made it look like he's just playing with knives in that intro, but man, what a what a high pressure job. It was really cool uh, as a business illiterate to talk to him about what it's like running such an awesome operation. Uh, very excited about the USA made uh knife line that will be uh, coming out in the offing. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another great uh, interview and Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, don't forget Thursday, Thursday night knives live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. Until then, uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast